Propagation and Integration of the Signal Alan Hodgkin and A.F. Huxley, along with John Eccles, won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1963, quote, for their discoveries concerning the ionic mechanisms involved in excitation and inhibition of the peripheral and central portions of the nerve cell membrane. They used the humble squid. And in fact, many essential elements of how chemical synapses function were discovered by studying these giant axons with their giant synapses. Squid have an escape response that uses jet propulsion and it's triggered by these giant axons that can be up to a millimeter and a half in diameter. Um, and this, so here you can see it's composed of three axons in a, in a network. Here's the first one, the first presynaptic, the second presynaptic, and then the, this postsynaptic giant axon. There's actually seven of them. Uh, this is the seventh one, the stellate axon and they basically innervate the entire mantle. This is a muscular sheath, and so when this giant axon fires, it coordinates the contraction to squirt all this water out through this funnel for jet propulsion. Isn't it super cool? And here you can see an actual preparation, and they have injected it with dye so that you can see the presynaptic axon and the postsynaptic. I love to read these memoirs from these famous scientists. And here is an article by A.F. Huxley reminiscing about Hodgkin 50 years later. So back in 1937, when a lot of this work was started, they were really, really young. Um, Huxley had just graduated from undergrad and Hodgkin was only a couple years older. So don't think that you can't contribute to science. So in 1937, at that time, it was believed that the action potential resulted from this huge change in permeability of the membrane to all ions, and that it occurred in association with an increase in um, potential to a threshold. But there was no experimental evidence that the electrical change spreading ahead of the action potential was actually sufficient to stimulate the next segment of the nerve fiber. And that is the evidence that was provided by Hodgkin in his first year of research in 1937. Okay, so here's Huxley. In the summer vacation of 1939, when I had just finished undergraduate work, <laughs> Hodgkin went to the laboratory of the Marine Biological Association at Plymouth, which is a famous marine lab to do experiments on the squid giant fiber, and he invited me to join him. We pushed an electrode down inside the fiber and recorded, potentially, uh, recorded potential directly across the membrane, finding that the interior became substantially positive during the action potential. This was contrary to Bernstein's theory, the prevailing theory, but it was not altogether a surprise to Hodgkin as he already had hints, unpublished, of this discrepancy from external measurements on fibers of crabs and lobsters. We could not pursue the problem further because war was obviously imminent, and we left Plymouth two days before Hitler invaded Poland. We published the result in a letter to Nature 1939 with no discussion or explanation. In a full paper, 1945, we gave four possible explanations, all wrong. It was also in 1945 that we began discussing the explanation that turned out to be correct, namely that the increase in permeability was highly specific for sodium ions, which were thereby enabled to diffuse inward carrying their positive charge. This was confirmed experimentally by Hodgkin and Katz, 1949. If we had known the paper of Overton, 1902, I am sure we would have reached that conclusion immediately in 1939. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> and here is their paper from 1952 that basically summarizes the entire series of experiments and creates their model of the membrane current and how the action potential works. Uh, this is their model of the electrical circuit representing the membrane. So um, 
The results described in the preceding papers suggest that the electrical behavior of the membrane may be represented by this network in figure one. Current, I, can be carried through the membrane either by charging the membrane capacity or by movement of ions through the membrane through the resistances in parallel with the capacity. The ionic current is divided into components carried by sodium and potassium ions, the INA and the IK, and a small leakage current, IL, made up by chloride and other ions. Each component of the ionic current is determined by a driving force, the EMF, which may be conveniently measured as an electrical potential difference and, importantly, a permeability coefficient, which has the dimensions of conductance. Okay, so it is actually the movement of the ions that they're getting at here. So thus, the sodium current, INA, is equal to the sodium conductance, GNA, multiplied by the difference between the membrane potential, E, and the equilibrium potential for the sodium ion, ENA. Similar equations apply to potassium and the leak. Our experiments suggest that conductance, GNA, and GK are functions of time, right? So importantly, that can change, and membrane potential. But that ENA, EK, EL, CM, and GL may be taken as constant. Okay, that's important. The influence of the membrane potential on permeability can be summarized by stating, first, that depolarization causes a transient, transient increase in sodium conductance and a slower but maintained increase in potassium conductance. Secondly, that these changes are graded and that they can be reversed by repolarizing the membrane. Okay, so this is like all this really intricate stuff here that they figured out. In order to decide whether these effects are sufficient to account for complicated phenomena such as the action potential and the refractory period, it's necessary to obtain expressions relating the sodium and potassium conductances to time. Timing is really important, right? and membrane potential. So before attempting this, we shall briefly consider what types of physical system are likely to be consistent with the observed changes in permeability. And these experiments led to the discovery of voltage-gated ion channels. So this was really genius stuff. So they measured nerve propagation by inserting recording electrodes and providing a stimulus with a stimulating electrode. With their subthreshold stimuli, they found that the traveling potential was electrotonic, graded, and passive, and decayed with distance. But what determines the distance propagated for anything that flows through a tube depends on the resistance, on two kinds of resistance. The distance is proportional, directly proportional, to membrane resistance. You can think about it like this. If you have a hose and it's full of holes, so you can see here all the leaks coming out, you're not going to have much flow through, right? Um, so a, a hose with a very strong membrane resistance is going to transmit greater flow. Distance is inversely proportional to internal resistance. Low internal resistance allows the flow to go through whereas blockages within the hose or high resistance will slow the flow. So for neurons, it's big diameter that produces low internal resistance and faster signal transmission. What about an action potential, though, that's active and non-decremental? The potential is propagated by moving down the membrane and then depolarizing the next region. We've already seen that one consequence of action potentials are that they are directional because of that absolute refractory period, so they can only proceed in one direction. But how do we increase conduction velocity? We have to increase the distance traveled per unit time. One way is to reduce the internal resistance. 
or perhaps to increase the external or membrane resistance. So the hypothesis is, do these same mechanisms work for action potentials too? The idea is that larger diameter axons reduce resistance to flow so that the electrotonic potential can travel faster before causing another depolarization. Myelin adds insulation, increasing the membrane resistance because they're basically just layers of lipid bilayer wrapped around and around, kind of like electrical tape on an electrical wire. It occurs by the growth of Schwann cells and the layers of cytoplasm wrap around the axon, which are lipid bilayer, which are not conductive. So an important feature are these nodes of Ranvier that occur between the, um, the Schwann cells. Okay, and so that's where the depolarizations go. They, they occur here and then jumps to the next one. So prior to 2004, when Ribchester et al. did this work, it was thought that conduction velocity was proportional to that internode distance between the Schwann cells but there was no direct evidence. They, what they found in this paper is that in growing neurons, so imagine what happens when your limbs grow longer. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Have you ever thought about how your nerves grow? Um, with Schwann cells, they have Kajal bands that play an important role in the elongation of the Schwann cells. So the Spanish neuroanatomist Santiago Ramon I. Kajal, who lived until 1934, identified many nervous system structures and his ideas for their function were often correct. He identified bands of cytoplasm in the Schwann cells in the vertebrate peripheral nervous system, and they're now shown to arise from adhesive patches that form between the outer surface of the myelin sheath and the Schwann cell plasma membrane. Without the Kajal bands, the cells elongate too slowly, so they're important for growth, and they produce short internodes that impair nerve conduction or impulse conduction. On the cover here, Kajal's drawing of a silver-stained myelinated nerve fiber is flanked by modern reconstructions showing how the bands act as nutrient transport channels on the right and how adhesive patches of red um, segregate the cytoplasm into Kajal bands green. Okay, so isn't this super cool? So with myelination, it increases the membrane resistance so that the electrotonic potential travels farther before depolarizing the next patch of membrane at the node of Rambier. So basically your signal is jumping from node to node and it's saltatory. Can we do further tests of the hypothesis? Sure, we can use the comparative method. So as we increase axon diameter, decreasing internal resistance, conduction is faster. With myelin, increasing membrane resistance also increases conduction. So both contribute to increasing conduction velocity, and they work both in myelinated and unmyelinated fibers. So here's a bunch of presynaptic terminals synapsing onto another neuron. And let's take a look at these synaptic connections. Remember the electrical synapse? Uh, we have some examples of this in the heart in giant axons in earthworms and in the vertebrate retina. Basically, we have the presynaptic membrane and the postsynaptic membrane or dendrites and gap junctions connecting the two. When we have an action potential traveling down the presynaptic membrane, so that electrical impulse just continues through. Um, we have a direct flow of current and so this promotes fast conduction and synchronization. 
A chemical synapse is a bit different. We still have the presynaptic and postsynaptic membrane, but we have a synaptic cleft and synaptic vesicles, receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So when we have that same action potential traveling down the presynaptic axon, we have a depolarization that causes an influx of calcium ions, which then causes the synaptic vesicles to move toward the terminus and release neurotransmitters into the cleft, which bind to the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, opening the sodium channels, which then depolarize the postsynaptic membrane. And these cause excitatory postsynaptic potentials, or EPSPs. The fact that calcium is required at synapses was demonstrated using the giant axon of jellyfish, using aquaporin that glow. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So the fact that these aquaporin glow when they're um, functioning allowed them to use a photoelectrode to measure luminescence that showed, um, that allowed the discovery of calcium participation in the synaptic vesicle release. And here's an electron micrograph of vesicle fusion at the synapse. So you can actually see it happening. And we have a whole lot of neurotransmitters that are associated with um, different animals as well as different portions of the nervous system, and they can act to excite or inhibit or both, depending on context. A lot of these are widespread, such as norepinephrine in the vertebrate CNS, and they can be excitatory or inhibitory. We can have drugs that mimic their action, like amphetamines, and we can also have drugs that block their inactivation for example, cocaine. Dopamine in the vertebrate CNS is pleasure producing, and so this is associated with addiction. And serotonin in the vertebrate CNS, and then we can also have drugs that block reuptake, such as Prozac. This is the acetylcholine receptor from the neuromuscular junction. And it's a transmembrane channel protein with neurotransmitter binding sites. So there's two binding sites for acetylcholine. And when they bind, they open. So it's pretty cool. It has this physical rotation of the membrane proteins opening this gap so that it opens. And it's not just that we have these synapses that are on or off. They can be modulated and adapted so here's a little bit about the secrets of mem memory. When we have repeated stimulation, we can have cyclic AMP that stimulates the protein kinase that then blocks the potassium channels and upregulates calcium. So we can have greater synaptic transmission. For example, you can observe this when we have an another neuron call called heterosynaptic facilitation. When you have a loud noise and you respond more to a tap on the shoulder um, than you did before. The Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2000 was awarded jointly to Arvid Carlson, Paul Greengird, and Eric Kandel for their discoveries concerning signal transduction in the nervous system. Candle studied the sea slug, and he discovered that the efficiency of synapses can be modified by molecular and morphological changes, and that these are important in learning and memory. So he discovered that a weak stimulus causes a protein phosphorylation of ion channels, which leads to um, increased neurotransmitter. That's for a short-term memory. A long-term memory requires stronger and more long-lasting stimulus, so more stimulus, and that leads to changes in the form and function of the synapse. It has a cyclic AMP pathway, which then create, causes um, upregulation of this protein kinase, 
which sends a signal to the nucleus that synthesizes other proteins, which will then increase the shape of the synapse. So it's like a bigger, more powerful synapse that can then increase a lot more transmitter. Arvid Carlson discovered the neurotransmitter dopamine in the brain and described its role in our ability to move. And this led to the realization that Parkinson's disease is caused by a lack of dopamine in certain parts of the brain, which is of course important for controlling movements. So his research led to the realization that Parkinson's disease could be treated with supplements of L-DOPA. So let's talk a bit more about synaptic integration. Um, you have one or more or many presynaptic terminals coming in and synapsing at the dendrites of the next neuron. And um, we can have integration going on in the brain or we can have integration going on in the spinal cord, um, other centers. And then the integration functions to basically decide whether or not the postsynaptic neuron is going to fire. So we have these excitatory postsynaptic potentials, right? So they're going on to the dendrites and those small, the, those EPSPs increase the likelihood that the neuron will transmit the impulse. It leads to a depolarization of the postsynaptic neuron and that results from either increasing the permeability of sodium or calcium. And if the stimulus is sufficient, it could lead to an action potential. Opposite to that is the inhibitory postsynaptic potential. It will decrease the likelihood that the neuron will transmit impulse. It causes hyperpolarization or stabilization of the membrane potential. And it results from an increase in the permeability of potassium or chloride. It's greater than the normal excitatory stimulus required to trigger an action potential. Let's look at synaptic integration. Okay, we have our presynaptic terminals onto the dendrites and the axon hillock where we have an increased concentration of sodium channels, which work to lower the threshold to trigger an action potential. So when they, we have um, two EPSPs, if they're too far apart, we won't get spatial summation. Okay, they're just too far apart to sum together. However, if they're closer together, but if one is an excitatory presynaptic potential and the other is inhibitory, they'll cancel, which again would lead to no summation and no transmission. However, if they're both excitatory and they're close enough together, we can have spatial summation. And that would lead to meeting threshold at the axon hillock and summation so that then we can transmit that signal down the axon. So that spatial summation requires that they're close in distance. Temporal is another kind of summation, the repeated stimulation. And it, so it could just be one, but if they're close in time, they can sum and again help this neuron reach threshold. So the nervous system can be thought of as this complex system of different types of signals where we have integration at the graded potentials, gathering information from sensory receptors, and when threshold is met, then a signal action potential is transmitted. And you can have multiple signals coming in from different sources and integrating for further action. So either to the motor um, effectors or glands or whatever other systems. So you can think of it as a chain of analog, digital, analog integration, digital transmission. So we can have a huge number of different types of responses according to the needs of the organism. Now this week in lab, you're going to do this really cool nerve lab on the toad sciatic nerve. It's the major nerve that runs down the hind limb. This is a picture, of course, of a single neuron, but remember that a nerve bundle is actually a bundle of many, many neurons.
okay? And they're all going down to their different motor pools in the leg. So what you're going to record, you're going to carefully dissect the nerve out of the hind limb and record from it. And it's really, really cool. So you're going to um, give it a stimulus. And then what you're going to observe is what's called a compound action potential. And it's compound because it's the sum of a number of different nerve fibers. So if you were able to measure each one individually, they might look like this. But of course, they differ a little bit in diameter. So some are going to be faster than others, and some are going to be slower than others. And overall, they sum to the compound action potential. Okay, so conceptually, that's what's going on. So they'll look a little bit broader and fatter than you might expect an action potential to look. Okay, make sense? Another thing to be aware of is that the stimulus is huge, right? And so you're going to observe a stimulus artifact always. So don't record that. That doesn't, that's not your data. <laughs> that's the stimulus. Okay. Um, but after you pass a threshold, you'll start to see the cap. So you can measure the amplitude of the cap, the peak amplitude. You can measure the timing from the beginning of the stimulus to the beginning of the cap. You can measure the latency of the peak of the cap. You can measure the duration of the cap. And then you can also vary the stimulus intensity and uh, find the voltage at which you can just make out the cap. Okay, so have a lot of fun. It's a super cool lab. Take care.